Need a mic? They were saying you can use this. I think you probably don't. You can you, probably just your, project. Your, 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 your mic will be the mic that's getting picked up. Picked up by right, 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 right. So I don't think you. Okay. I think we'll all be able to hear you, but okay. if you want the mic, there we go. Uh, hello, everybody, uh, in here and out there, as they say. Uh, welcome to Smith College and to our talk tonight, uh, the Unno Taitetsu Memorial Lecture, uh, given in honor of uh, one of our beloved senior uh, late uh, professors of Buddhist studies here at Smith College, Taitetsu Unno. Uh, pretty much, you know, the founder of East Asian Studies at Smith College. Uh, you can talk it from history to language, uh, and of course, Buddhist studies as well. Um, he retired a few years ago and passed away uh, a few years ago as well. And so we, uh, we like to honor him by inviting a distinguished guest every year to give a lecture uh, in his honor. And I'm not going to say much more uh, about Taitetsu Uno because Usually I'm told that I spent too much time talking about him and taking time away from our <laughs> the speaker. So I'm just going to say, uh, I don't need to say anything about Unno Sensei if you already know him. And if you don't know him, you should go out and stalk him on Google and find out about him and read some of his stuff because uh, he was an amazing, uh, an amazing man. Uh, but I would uh, like to um, introduce our speaker tonight. We're very honored to have Duncan Buchanan Williams here with us. Uh, William Sensei, Duncan San, I'm not <laughs> sure how to do this. Duncan, Duncan Kun, Duncan, Duncan Kun, I don't know. Uh, Duncan San uh, is, uh, he's from Japan, born in Japan, born in Tokyo, raised between uh, Japan and England, uh, coming to the United States as kind of a late teenager, going to school here at Reed College, am mm -hmm. I right? That's where I went, Maria. We were classmates. We were classmates. Okay. Um, and, then, um, and then at Harvard. Uh, currently, he's at USC, where he holds a number of positions. Uh, I won't name them all, but a lot of, a lot of different positions there, uh, kind of anchoring, including being the chair of his department, and anchoring a lot of the Buddhist studies programs there. Uh, Professor Williams' background is in Zen traditions. Uh, he's an ordained Zen teacher, um, and he has recently been working a lot, uh, not on the Zen side, which was his, his earlier publications and work were about Zen uh, in Japan, and lately he's been working on Asian American questions. And of course, um, uh, most recently, this book, uh, American Sutra, A Story of Faith and Freedom in the Second World War, has been published uh, to great acclaim. And um, that's part of that is what he's going to speak to here. Um, it's interesting, we've been talking um, since uh, we ran into each other over at the hotel. Uh, both uh, his professor at Harvard, uh, Nagatomi Sensei, uh, was not in the camps here. He was in Japan at the time, but his wife was. Uh, my professor at Wisconsin, Minoru Kyoto, was in the camps, in the high security camps, because he was considered a risk. His citizenship was stripped, his uh, passport was taken away, and he was used by the CIA for all sorts of devious purposes. Um, and these stories are amazing and they're poignant, and um, there's maybe more of access to some of these stories. Um, Two Homelands is out there now, um, there's, there's several other works, but very little of it has focused on the, the factor of religion and how that played out during these times. And very few people realize that among the very first people rounded up and herded off to the fairgrounds or to wherever they were being sent to were, um, were people who were religious leaders in their communities because somehow that connection to their religious um, affiliation was considered even more possibly dangerous uh, than for other folks. So, um, so Professor Williams has brought that uh, to great light here. He's done a whole lot of uh, very interesting and deep work in uh, people's diaries and other unpublished materials in order to unearth these stories of how faith and religion uh, worked and played out um, during this period. 
Uh, today he's going to talk to us about something a little bit different, um, which is monuments. Uh, why are there no monuments? Why have there been no monuments uh, for the people who have been inter who were interned in these camps? Uh, and so he's been working on a project to that effect. So um, without further ado, <laughs> Professor Williams. <laughs> So thank you so much for that kind introduction and for uh, uh, the honor really to be able to be part of a series uh, related to Taitetsu no and uh, Memorial Lecture Series. Uh, I, this is not going to be a Buddhist studies talk, uh, but uh, I hope something that brings in some Buddhism, but mainly a way to talk about and honor uh, 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 Taitetsu no. Uh, uh, first of all, we just, just mentioned uh, his uh, time in World War II, and um, he was actually in two different uh, camps, but I wanted to start with that. Uh, this is a, a page from what's called the final accountability roster that the War Relocation Authority put together for a camp in Arkansas called Rower. And uh, maybe a little bit hard to see, um, but you can see uh, the whole UNO family uh, listed under family number 10389. Uh, and, uh, you know, his father's there. So you can see Taitetsu, you know, as a young teenager uh, being listed in this uh, uh, document. Uh, his uh, uh, birth date is given, his uh, 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 where they came from and then where they ultimately ended up out of this camp. Many people uh, had experiences uh, of being in multiple camps and these uh, type of government records uh, uh, try to, you know, uh, capture uh, something of, of what is the movement of population uh, from where to where. And so I wanted to just start with this one uh, as, as just a, a base document that later I'm going to come to refer to uh, uh, in terms of why names are important. That's going to be one of the main themes of, of uh, how to think about memorializing and monumentalizing and thinking about how to honor people uh, like Taitetsu no who experienced uh, for, you know, forced removal and indefinite incarceration. Uh, uh, and in, in, in some families' cases, especially those with Buddhist priests uh, as, as fathers, uh, separation, uh, family separation as well. Uh, one of the most um, moving experiences I had with uh, Taiji Suno was in 2004. He had not been back to Arkansas, this camp, uh, in 60 years. And uh, uh, he uh, and his wife Alice, who was in a different camp in Arkansas, a few miles down the street called Jerome, uh, went on a pilgrimage. And as the 60th anniversary of uh, uh, certain, uh, certain events of World War II, uh, the University of Arkansas had a, had a conference, and then I, g I gave one of the talks and so forth. But at the site itself, uh, when we went to visit uh, this camp that he, as a young, uh, 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 boy uh, experienced, uh, he led a Buddhist ceremony uh, at the today only remaining kind of artifact of that camp. Uh, some camps like Manzanar and Minidoka and Heart Mountain today are run by the National Park Service, uh, you know, with park rangers and it, it's like become a historic site that's been preserved. But out there in Arkansas, uh, it's just basically cotton field, you know, like fields of cotton uh, have, have grown over the areas that used to be the camp. Uh, and the only thing that remains is this small cemetery uh, that was dedicated uh, with a monument during World War II uh, by Reverend Daitetsu Hayashima, a Buddhist priest of, of the same Buddhist sect as uh, Taitetsu no Nishihonganji. And uh, exactly uh, 60 years later, he stood at that site to remember his own experience, but the experience of many families that were there uh, returning to Arkansas uh, for the first time. And I was there just being an assistant. I was, he, he was chanting the Heart Sutra uh, uh, 
at the site, and it was like George Takei, the actor. Uh, he he was also a child in that in that particular camp. So he was helping me, and I was helping Taidetsuro, and and he led the ceremony to kind of remember, in many ways, for the first time in 60 years, uh, what had happened to a people who, you know, they were given like a week to 10 days, his family to 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 look around their house and gather what they could and what they could carry, which often meant just a single suitcase, and, and going to a place unknown for an, you know, a, a, a time unknown. Uh, there was no understanding that it would you know, be a one-year incarceration or the sentences for three years. It, it was for an unknown period of time. And uh, it really devastated, I think, many, many families, including his. And uh, he stood there and uh, chanted the Heart Sutra. And uh, there was something very powerful about being at that place where this monument that uh, was directed in terms of its design and architecture uh, as a kind of gorinto or five-tiered stupa um, made by, uh, and the words inscribed are by this uh, Buddhist priest, uh, Reverend Hayashima. He had this theory that um, I think is very Buddhist based idea of a monument, but he said, uh, I think, you know, this monument's on a lotus uh, base, uh, if you look closely, and um, uh, as you may know, there's this Buddhist uh, imagery we have about a, a flower coming out of the mud, out of a lotus flower coming out of uh, muddy waters, and uh, this idea that uh, uh, it's not just about transcendence and about liberation from the difficult world of the muddy world, but uh, it's about the idea that, that lotus flowers cannot grow uh, if there is no muddy nutrients that will give them something to, to, to grow up. And so he used uh, the barbed wire from the camp. He used uh, concrete rebars that he found lying around to actually structurally to give this monument that was built in 1944 structural integrity, to take the very things that were about incarceration, to have some way to remember uh, that there was other worlds, other, other ways to uh, think about a, a way to be free in, 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 in a place that was unfree, a way to console uh, families that had all those you know markers that you can see in this photo all the people who had lost not only their homes their businesses and you know education disrupted all all, all of their life kind of upended that loss but also those who had lost family members in these camps uh, he wanted to stand there and build something out of the very things that were uh, unfreeing to give some kind of monument to, to freedom. And so that was where, uh, back in 2004, Taitetsuno stood to kind of recreate a moment through ceremony and ritual for those who had gathered often for the first time in 60 years to do something uh, that would memorialize and monumentalize that occasion. And so I wanted to start there uh, as a kind of uh, uh, way to way to think about this project that I'm I'm, I'm working on, uh, that is related to, uh, of course, Professor Titus Uno, Reverend Uno, but also as uh, Professor Harvey mentioned, uh, uh, my one of my uh, primary uh, initial mentor at, at Harvard um, uh, when I was in graduate school, Rever uh, Professor Masatoshi Nagatomi, and and his family story as well, and so today. There are three World War II era monuments with the name uh, that has this name Ide in, in it. Uh, the Japanese characters, and I'm going to go to the next one just so you can see it a little bit clearer. Uh, uh, e, you know, is to 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 uh, to uh, uh, console uh, uh, the and Re usually means like uh, spirits, and to, To means like tower, and at Rower where Taitetsuno was, they call it Irehi, which is a, you know, just a, like a, like a, 
uh, a standing a structure or, or, or a monument. And uh, over in Amachi, uh, the Amachi concentration camp in, in Colorado, they also had a smaller uh, uh, ireto. But this kind of idea of, of uh, building monuments to console the spirits, spirits of those who, uh, because these were in their respective camp cemeteries, those who had in recent times uh, passed away. Uh, but also going further to remember and console the ancestors. And then also the families who had lost all these people. Uh, that's why I think uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, remnants, uh, you know, in the middle of a desert, uh, in the middle of a cotton field still remains. And you may see, this is uh, from the Nagatomi collection at the Manzanar Historical Site today. Uh, but it's an early sketch of what uh, Nagatomi Sensei and earlier Reverend Hayashima conceived of as these five tiers of a, of a gorinto or a stupa, and uh, how they were uh, keen on building something that would memorialize uh, the people who were there. Uh, often, uh, how should we say, you know, rounded up in such a manner uh, that it didn't matter if you were like a teenager like Taitetsuno. It didn't matter if you're like his, you know, the grandmother, like th who's infirmed. Or it, it didn't matter if you're a U.S. citizen or if you're a Japanese uh, national. Uh, they were all kind of lumped together in this kind of uh, uh, undifferentiated mass of people who were considered threats to national security because of their race and because of their religion. And so, uh, what the Buddhist priests in that period wanted to do, I think, was to say people and individuals whose lives are lost matter, and they need to be uh, monumentalized in this way. And so while Reverend Hayashima had this theory about making things out of the you know, barbed wire and rebar and kind of using that Buddhist philosophy, uh, um, uh, uh, Reverend Nagatomi in, 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 in Manzanar, he wanted to build this thing, this structure that still exists today uh, as a symbol of the camps um, uh, by, by bringing in uh, the whole community, uh, donating five cents or 10 cents per family to buy the concrete necessary. And it was the Young Buddhist Association of, of San Pedro, which is a part of LA that's like near Terminal Island and uh, the, the kind of Fisher people's community uh, the Young Buddhist uh, Association of that community were kind of uh, good with manual labor. You know, they could do it. So they, they built this thing uh, after buying the concrete. And Reverend Nagatomi kept on practicing every night. I de to, I de to, until he got it right. Because once you put it in concrete, it's hard to, you know, uh, redo. And so he did that, and he did that with a certain uh, timeline in mind. In the Japanese Buddhist tradition, uh, there's an you know, important ceremony in the summer called Obon, Urabonge, uh, or from you know, Ulambana. Uh, but th this idea of, 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 of uh, as a community coming together in ceremony and sometimes also in festival in terms of Bon Odori, like dan Obon dancing. There are different kinds of things that people did uh, once a summer. Uh, for example, in my uh, home, town areas uh, uh, where I grew up in Japan, uh, we would always have a eggplant that we put like a chopsticks to make like a horse looking thing or other things to kind of help the ancestors come to uh, kind of make their journeys to this world once a year. Uh, we put out lanterns and they're often they're called toro nagashi but on waterways to create the lanterns to help the ancestors come and also depart once a year. But in the Japanese tradition, it's called Nibon, the first Obon after somebody dies. That's the one that's important to memorialize. In the Japanese memorial tradition, in the Buddhist tradition, it's, you know, of course you have a wake or shonanoka, you know, shonanoka and you, thir seven days, 13 days, you know, 49 days when the spirit goes to, and then one year, 13 years, 49, you know, we have these kind of series of dates that are used for memorializing, but Nibon is one that is for the community at large. Everyone 
who's passed away that previous year gets remembered, honored. And so for that reason, uh, you can see Nagatomi Sensei here um, uh, you know, performing funeral. You see the, in the Manzanar Buddhist uh, church, as they called the barrack, barracks that they used for uh, uh, Sangha gatherings, uh, they, they, they had a, uh, had a I guess the, the word they used at the time was columbarium, like where they put the ashes of those who are uh, in urns and so forth. Uh, and and he, he wanted to build this thing by August of 1943, so that it would be in time for the Nibong, the first Obon of the period. And so this is a picture of the Manzanar Ireto, that, that Buddhist monument uh, being dedicated and people coming to pay their respects about all those who passed away. And this is a period in which, uh, you know, the first thing that people uh, were told when they went into these camps was that if you have a Buddhist sutra, uh, or even like a book of poetry, like haiku poetry, that was considered contraband. You know, when you enter a prison, they'll often search you for contraband. And it's kind of to be expected, like maybe they're searching for weapons, a gun, or because of the fears of espionage, maybe a camera or something like that. But if you had a Buddhist sutra, that was contraband. If you had a, anything, a book published in Japan, that was considered contraband as they entered these euphemistically called uh, assembly centers. And those would be confiscated with two exceptions. One was if you had a Japanese English language dictionary, that was okay. Or if you had a uh, Japanese language Christian Bible, that was also okay. So what's the message that families like the Unos and the Nagatomis were receiving? They're being told that to be a loyal American, to be one that is not a threat to national security, you need to, if, if you're gonna have any Japanese at all, it's for the purpose of learning English. So Anglo in the sense of both whiteness and also English only, but then you know, also being Christian would be some marker of belonging, of loyalty. And so it was that even within uh, this camp in 1943, uh, when the United States government issued this, it's sometimes called the loyalty questionnaire, but more formally it should be called the leave clearance forms, where they asked certain questions to gauge people's loyalty. And they had certain questions, if you answered wrong about whether you would serve in the US military or not, or whether you would uh, renounce the emperor, like certain questions, if you answer those wrong, you were sent to a special camp uh, called Tula Lake, and that's where Tai Uno and his family ended up, right? And, and there was a question about religion, on the question number 16. And if you answered a Christian on it, you got uh, plus points, plus two points. If you answered Buddhist, you got minus one point. If you answered Shinto, you were completely banned from leave clearance. And it's something that I often think it's like, it doesn't make any sense, because if you were an actual spy, or somebody intending to be a saboteur. Of course you'd answer Christian, you know, because you kind of know what these, so, but that was the way they distinguished. And so in that context, in the summer of 1943, when people were being told, being somehow affiliated with the Japanese language or chanting in Japanese or, or, or doing things that have that kind of uh, heritage or being Buddhist was, you know, uh, something that would be considered uh, all markers of a threat to national security, a threat to being able to leave camp ever uh, uh, with these leave clearance forms. Uh, the Buddhist community uh, assembled in large numbers to kind of make the case that we can be both Buddhist and American at the same time. We're not a threat uh, to, to the nation. And they gathered, uh, and you see in this photo, it says, uh, if you can read the you know, Japanese, it says, Manzana Bukyokai uh, Bon Odori, and then so the date is 1943, August the 15th. So the day before the 14th is when the monument was, was dedicated. And so it was for this purpose of, of both consoling the spirits of those who passed, the ancestors, the families, but then coming together in community, unafraid to be Buddhist inside 
a concentration camp with armed guards and barbed wire. Uh, this was something that uh, uh, in all of these different camps, these, this is a Heart Mountain, uh, uh, Wyoming, Amachi, Colorado, and Manzanar, uh, California. So that's the context of some of these monuments that, that were built back in World War II. And it's in that context that I've been thinking a lot about what can we do today to heal and repair that history. Um, one of the other Buddhist priests that I often think about, uh, Reverend Kyoshiro uh, Tokunaga, he served at the San Jose Buddhist Temple. Uh, he would use the words, uh, the karma of a nation. Uh, this is when uh, Japanese Americans in the 1980s, he was one of the people that testified in front of a congressional committee about his own experiences of being taken uh, uh, as a Buddhist priest to camp uh, right away after the war began, how he fell ill and how, he, how a African American train porter helped him nurse back to health and how they, it was not just about the physical health, but be, they began talking about their respective communities' experiences. And later he became the only kind of first generation immigrant, kind of Issei, as they are, they're called in the Japanese American community, uh, litigant in, 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 a, in a lawsuit uh, filed by uh, 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 the National Japanese American Committee on, on Reparations. And so there was a whole movement uh, that began in the 70s and 80s to, to try to repair this history. And, and people like uh, Reverend Tokunaga would say, it's not just that as individual persons we have karma that we have to deal with and contend with, you know, the things that our parents give us, our ancestors give us, but it's like a nation can have a karma too. And he called, started calling it the racial karma of, 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 of America. And so I've been thinking a lot about his words as well. So Reverend Nagatomi, Reverend Uno, Reverend uh, uh, Tokunaga, these type of people who contended with uh, this history, what it meant to their individual, but also family, but also community, but also what does it mean for a nation to, to think about such a large scale uh, denial of due process. Usually before you get put in a prison, you have some kind of, you know, you're supposed to have committed a crime and some you know, jury of your peers should have reviewed the evidence. But there was nothing like that. 125,000 such persons in camp. And so I've been thinking about monuments uh, uh, such as the one uh, in Alabama, the National uh, Memorial for Peace and Justice. I think more commonly people would know it as the lynching memorial. Um, and in terms of form and in terms of what that project was, I think many of you know Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice, you know, the, 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 that whole movement to kind of reckon with uh, not only uh, the period of slavery in American life, but uh, all of the Jim Crow, you know, all of the racial violence that happened uh, 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 in terms of lynching uh, and all of the effort that went to put uh, from different counties in the American South the names of people who had often been lost. The amount of research that went into court filings, into newspaper accounts, to just to remember people's names as a way of, uh, this, this monument uh, is, is on the cover of uh, one of the most important books on black reparations today, From Here to Equality by uh, Duke Professor William Darity. Uh, but uh, I think in that movement, the idea of kind of remembering names in a time when the nation would have liked to have forgotten. Um, I think that's something that has been kind of uh, in my mind because for Japanese Americans, that history is also there, not just in the camps, you know, they got those tags and they got numbered as family, num you know, all that, but um, you can see here, uh, you know, these are very well-known cases from Bainbridge Island, Washington, you know, all these, where people just, they're just treated like luggage tags. You know, like you, you, get, you get a number and you, 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 you don't have a name anymore. And this 
was as early as the first Japanese immigrants who came to America, uh, uh, or at least uh, in this case uh, before America, but uh, in the Kingdom of Hawaii and later the territory of Hawaii to work on the sugar plantations. That's where uh, the largest number of Japanese uh, immigrants settled. And there on the plantations, they couldn't pronounce the Yoshinagas and the Hirakawas and whatever, so they just got numbers. And th these numbers, they just got called by numbers, and they were called bango, which in Japanese just means number, but they just got these little tags that, that had numbers on them. So that's what I, I kind of like think back about, we should do something to remember people's names. And this is why I'm going back to that first document. There are some records that help us uh, to be able to know what these names are and to be able to create maybe a, a, a new kind of monument. And just because I learned a few minutes ago, we were, we were in Maya Lin's uh, designed, uh, you know, uh, structure. Uh, you know, of course, her project for the Vietnam War Memorial was a names monument, one where she had a very particular theory about names and about monuments, where she, instead of putting it in alphabetical order, she put all the Vietnam War, uh, uh, you know, by killed in action, uh, date of combat death. And her idea was that it's not supposed to be just uh, easy to find by, by alphabet. You go and find your uncle or whatever by, by, by trying to understand this larger context of the war, in which year somebody may have died, and see and take a look at the persons next to it. And she had this idea about engaging with monuments through looking carefully at names. And I think the, uh, the people that built the 9-11 Memorial in New York City have, had a their own ideas about the power of names, as did uh, the lynching memorial in, in Alabama. So uh, I've, been, I've been just out of respect for the World War II period monuments. I've been trying to call the project that I'm engaged in, uh, the ide, you know, using the ide to ide, idehi from the World War II uh, mo names uh, monument. And here I'm trying to do something which is to, on the basis of collecting for the first time every single person of Japanese ancestry incarcerated during World War, camp, uh, World War II in all the different types of camps. There were many different kinds run by different agencies. Some run by the US Army, some run by the Department of Justice, some run by a civilian agency called the War Relocation Authority. Those are the ones that are big ones that are known like Manzanar, like Rower, et cetera. But how do we create a list of everyone not leaving anybody out, you know? And uh, how do we uh, uh, display those names as a monument? And the first idea I wanted to kind of explore after creating the list, which I'll talk about how we go about doing that in a moment. The first idea was like, you know, at our temples, we have on the right-hand side of the altar, uh, most of our historic Japanese American temples, we have a kakocho, uh, you know, like, a, like a, literally the book of the past. Right? And it has all the names of the temple members from the time of the founding of the temple all the way up to now. And whenever we do our memorial services, like Shotsuki Hoyo, a monthly memorial service, we chant sutras and then we, we recite all the names of everyone in you know, the month of February who passed. You know, and we say their names as a form of ritual. And so I had this idea like we should create a book of names of everyone. Uh, like a sacred book of names. And that that should just be names. Not about what camp they were in. But it's not about data and information, but like just honoring names. But there should be a place for knowing that Tai went to both, you know, Professor uh, Tai Tezuno was both in Rower and also into like, like, so I thought I'd create a website. I'm calling it Irezo, you know, Zo in Japanese is like, means like storehouse, but like a, but, but on the, on the internet, it's a kind of, kind of storehouse. Uh, a, a website where you can actually find out not only people's names, but in alphabetical order per camp, per, you know, which camps they, they kind of transferred in and out of. And I'm working with an organization called Densho up in Seattle, Washington, uh, that uh, has the largest collection of photographs 
from that World War II period uh, so that we're going to also put a face to each person and honor each individual uh, with these kind of uh, uh, something that we can do on the, on, 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 online. And finally, building what was built in Rower uh, at that cemetery that Reverend Duno uh, was at, the Ire, Irehi, an actual art installation to kind of showcase and display the names. Unlike the Vietnam War Memorial, you know, there's more, way more people who experienced incarceration. So physically, you'd have to get a much bigger space than the Vietnam War Memorial to fit all those names on if you're going to put them on a, you know, granite stone, you know, engraved. So I, I came up with a little bit different idea of how, how to rethink the idea of what a memorial or a monument could be. So I'm going to go into that in a moment. Am I okay with time? Because I, 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 I have a lot, to, a lot more to say if it's okay. Um, so, uh, uh, so one thing was that, that uh, I, I was kind of intent to try to honor Professor Nagatomi and his family and Mrs. Nagatomi and, and then Uno, people like the Uno, like so many people uh, who, who uh, uh, you know, directly experienced or our descendants. And, and, and uh, I was shocked to find that unfortunately, no one, even the US government, no, no one's ever, ever created a comprehensive, accurate, full listing of names. Some of the big camps, like that first document I show you, the final accountability roster, it, meant, it was meant as, as they were closing down the camps, the government would account for Finally, you know, at the, at the end of the of the encounter, who was in the camp? But uh, there are dozens and dozens of these camps where they didn't have such a roster, and even with the roster, I'm going to go into in a moment. They're just it's 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 replete with errors, and so I would have thought that maybe you know when redress happened, reparations happened for Japanese Americans in 1988, the Civil Liberties uh, Act of 1988 signed by Ronald Reagan uh, provided for three things. A, a letter of apology from the federal government, the first time, you know, unlike black reparations, unlike Native American, like it's the first time that the government actually uh, issued not only a formal apology but a reparations check to each person of $20,000. And there was a government agency called the ORA, the Office of Redress Administration. And I thought maybe that office surely would have a created list. But I talked to many staffers who worked in that. And they were like, Duncan, they, this is a time when they, we didn't have Excel files. And we had, you know, we had paper things flowing everywhere. And it was just chaos. And they ultimately did end up giving 81,000 plus, you know, checks. Uh, so they did have you know, a certain number of names, but nothing total, comprehensive. Uh, and they were like the errors on the spelling of names, both because the government list from back then didn't spell it right, uh, and or people were in more than one camp, and one roster says one name, and it's spelled differently in a different one. There's just so much uh, work to try to, if you're trying to create a names monument, you need to have kind of like, what is the accurate, you know, authoritative name? And so one of the things is that in, for the camps that don't have these rosters to begin with, I started doing research on collecting as many, um, uh, how should you say, transfer lists, uh, internally created, generated, sometimes in Japanese language, uh, created lists, uh, uh, kind of interim lists and, and so on and so forth. And you can see, uh, for example, in um, uh, some of these camps uh, run by the Department of Justice, uh, the big ones are like Santa Fe, New Mexico, Lordsburg, New Mexico, Crystal City, Texas, and Fort Lincoln. Um, they, they, they had uh, the internees themselves created lists. Uh, sometimes the Buddhist priests had their own kind of list of priests. People from uh, Hawaii, picked up in Hawaii had their own uh, directories and things like that. And basically, I've been spending years trying to collate all of them uh, and uh, translating you know, from Japanese into Roman. 
uh, lettering. Sometimes it would look something like this from Fort, Fort Lincoln, uh, where uh, you know. Uh, Tojiro Suzuki started to make lists of his own and, and, and so on. So it's kind of combining these handwritten materials from the internees themselves with this kind of government uh, uh, documents uh, before the, even the final accountability rosters. They would create these, uh, this month, these are the names of the people in this camp, that kind of idea. And so I've been going through all of these and then combining them with these uh, forms at the end. And there's another form at the beginning uh, called Form 26. It's the form that people filled out when they first went into camp. And this is also why sometimes people have a lot of discussions about how many people were in camp. And you hear numbers of like roughly 110,000 or up to 120,000 or more than 125,000 and like nobody knows. And this I'm talking about like the Japanese American National Museum doesn't know. Densho doesn't know. Like all the authoritative people don't know because a, 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 a comprehensive list has never been made. And the reason often people say 110,000 is because of this form, Form 26. It, it's about 109,000 uh, some people went into camp to the ones run by the civilian agency called the War Relocation Authority. It doesn't count all the people that went to the army camps, the Department of Justice camps, who people rounded up earlier, the community leaders uh, round up earlier, et cetera. But, um, uh, and it doesn't account for people, like babies born, there were 7,000 babies born in camp in the war, war period. So it doesn't count those people. So once you start adding it up, it gets closer and closer to about 125,000. Uh, and so I'm hoping in addition to having a list to honor people, it will also be able to solve the question of how many people were in camp of Japanese ancestry. Um, I'm the, you know, we, saw, we saw some examples of these kind of documents, but the, 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 I'm just going to, if you don't mind, geek out just for a moment about, about the, the, the issues of, of coming up with these authoritative names so that you can have a names monument, uh, so that you can be confident that we're, we're, we're naming people accurately, because I think that would be the kind of ins ultimate insult is not getting it right. Uh, uh, you know, as I said, the government didn't care. The government, you know, so I'm trying to get it right. And so one of the things that happens is that because people were often in two, and those who are in the Department of Justice camps, three, four, five, six different camps, their names on these different transfer lists and camp rosters and internee direct, they're all slightly diff spelled differently. And so I had to come up with a set of rules to kind of, how do we consistently come up with the right names? And so I, ju it, I, it just, I just called it five, you know, the, the, the five rules. Uh, and, and, and then, so preponderance of evidence. So, it, you know, if, five uh, out of six rosters have it spelled one way, I'm probably gonna take that over the one different one. But not always, not always. But usually uh, one kind of way that I've been dealing with this is uh, just uh, preponderance of the, of, of the names. Uh, and then the historicity, meaning when we look at these names, uh, the, the main issue has to do with uh, people changing their names later. You know, and so for women, that's the most common. They get married and their names change. So when we check things on like obituaries or ancestry.com, you know, they've got these 1940 census and you know, uh, social security death index and there's all kinds of things you can check, birth certificates and so forth. But which I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use the name of the person you know, as they were in camp and, and prioritizing that for this kind of names monument, as opposed to a name that they may have been born with uh, or a name they use later in life. Um, and then the maximalism, like sometimes some have a Japanese name and an Anglo, you know, a, a, a middle, sometimes it's missing a middle name. Something. So I just decided to honor the person in their fullest name, just be maximal in, if they have a middle name, we'll go with that one that has the, as much of the name as possible. Uh, and a dorsality is just the last name. So this is usually to do with women that get married in camp. 
Uh, I, you have to, if you're going to only choose one name, one of the difficulties is if they entered camping with one name, but then they got married and they come out with a different name, which one are you going to use for this monument? And this is one where it's kind of like, it's actually not necessarily, it could go either way, right? And so I just decided to go with what is out. And the reason is I'm making this monument for descendants. And when I would ask many, many interviews, you know, lots of different people to talk about this project, and, and I would ask them like, do you know what your grandmother's maiden name was? And most people couldn't, they wouldn't know. So I was like, okay, it's probably better to do their married name because for descendants, it's probably what they know best. So that was just a kind of choice. Um, and then formalism has to do with like, if somebody's named, you know, uh, uh, Jimmy versus James, or, you know, like, like uh, but they're, they're both on the things, then I just decided to go with, we'll do you, it's a monument, we'll do the most formal. So it's all kind, this is all a little bit random, but I just decided these are the rules I'm gonna use. And based on these rules, what can we get? And then I made the sixth rule. And this is when the actor George Takei, uh, uh, when I was telling him about this project, and I was asking him, like, he has two different names. In Rower, where you know, he was uh, same age, uh, uh, he was younger than uh, Tai Tetsuno, but in the same camp. He went by Hosato George Takei. And then in Tula Lake, same, same thing. His family, Takei family, also moved like the Uno family to Tula Lake because they answered the you know, loyalty question in a certain way. And so they went into Tula Lake, and in that camp it says Hosato with a Z instead of Hosato with an S, George Takei. And so I was like, which one is right? You know, and the thing, Hosato, Hosato, in Japanese, the characters, you could potentially read it either way, so it's not like, wrong, wrong, like there's some other things that's totally, you know it's a clerical typist mistake. But this is not wrong, it could be either way. So I asked him, which one do you want? And he goes, I, I've never used the Z, so I always use S, so I created this kind of camp survivor rule <laughs> where if they have a voice in it, uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna honor that as well. And you, in his case, what I probably would have done if I didn't know him and could call him up or whatever, is to say, look at all these 1940 census records, his birth certificate, et cetera. And in his birth certificate, he is listed Hosato Takei, but no George. And he, he told me this fascinating story of the fact that his dad was an Anglophile and had memorized the names of all the kings and queens of England. And Six months after he was born, George VI was, you know, had the coronation. And his father was so excited that he added the name George as his kind of middle name, right? And so on the camp rosters, according to my rules, he should be listed Hosato George Takei, right? Because you use the, the birth certificate, says, says it's an S, and so, okay, we're gonna choose that one. And then the maximum rule says we include the middle name, so George, even though that's not in the birth certificate. But the camp survivor one made it, he was like, Duncan, I wanna flip it. I, 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 everybody knows me as George Takei, so can you flip it and go George Hosato Takei for this thing? So I was like, okay, we can do that. So these are the type of things of like getting families. Also, for example, I mentioned Reverend Tokunaga, the one who said the karma of the nation. His family, they like, if you look at the World War II, all the documents show he's born in a certain date. And because I'm sequencing people, uh, in, unlike my Lin, not by combat death, but date of birth, so that the oldest person goes first in the name of books, and the young babies being born at the end of the war go at the end, the kind of like where you are in that matters. And so I've been looking at the dates, mainly to make sure I'm cross-referencing the names to make sure, there's so many like Mary Yamadas that you have to make sure you got, the, you know, you're in the right date, the right person. And so date of birth was mattering and in that family, all the records in the World War II period, the historicity rule says I should look at that. His World War II draft card has the same date as the one that the you know, camp roster says, but his family say orally, he told them his date of birth was something in a different month 
day and year, and that that's what they put on his tombstone. And so I was like, okay, we're gonna, the family, and they were, insert, they were like, don't use the, well, whatever he may have written back then, but please use the one that accords with his tombstone. So I was like, okay, fine. So these rules are kind of what I'm using, but I'm also kind of trying to be flexible as, as the community people are involved. And so it's gonna end up, you know, the book looking something uh, like this, and uh, uh, I, I mentioned the, the, there's gonna be a website version of it, and then for the, for the actual installation, the irehi, the installation, uh, I'm t very much trying to think about maybe using, you know, the, what, what people like Reverend Nagatomi uh, and Reverend Hayashima used back in World War II and have this kind of five-tiered idea. It's, it is a kind of important concept for memorialization in uh, World War II and in Buddhist, you know, uh, kind of memorialization practice in general. I think many of you know, like, you know, this is called sotoba. You know, it's a Japanese way of saying stupa, but uh, in a Japanese, typical Japanese you know, cemetery, you'll find outdoors large, long wooden sticks with uh, people's kaimyo or the posthumous Buddhist name uh, written on. And of course, you got the, at the top the five notches and five you know, stupa. It, the, it, this very typical uh, uh, thing. Uh, and in this case, this was uh, uh, done by uh, Reverend uh, Michimo Totori in Hawaii. Uh, he was the only immigrant Buddhist priest. There was, you know, 250 Buddhist priests picked up by the FBI. Uh, he, he was the only one who didn't get picked up. He was old, kind of elderly, and he, he, he was actually known to the FBI uh, bureau chief of Honolulu. So they kind of left him alone. And one of the things he did was as the combat deaths started coming in from uh, uh, Europe, uh, with the 442nd Regimental Combat Team this, and the 100th Battalion, this all Japanese American segregated unit serving there, as well as uh, those who served in the military intelligence unit, uh, translating and doing prisoner interrogation and so forth in the Pacific. As these names came in, he would give people uh, kaimyo or, or Buddhist posthumous names and make these uh, special uh, things. So I was like, you know, everywhere during that time, they use this kind of five tier thing. I need to. Uh, maybe think about that. And then the other thing I've been thinking about, and, and I'll try to start wrapping up, uh, about how to create a monument that is worthy, uh, that is gonna be about names, but also draws on tradition uh, uh, from the Buddhist tradition, but also some j more broadly, more Japanese cultural traditions, Japanese American cultural traditions. I've been thinking a lot about uh, uh, having the monument not just be a monument of remembrance, but a monument of repair. And thinking about repair traditions, and, you know, so reparations, but in, a, but, but in a kind of more Japanese, Japanese American, Buddhist way. And thinking about things like ceramic repair traditions in Japan, like kintsugi, right? So we, this is, I don't think to this audience I need to explain, but you know, uh, the idea of kind of when you have a favorite teacup or plate or whatever, and it breaks, instead of throwing it away, you repair it. So at king and you know, gold and then uh, uh, tsugi from the verb tsugu to, 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 to rejoin and so forth with lacquer. So you rejoin it, but instead of hiding the crack, hiding the fracture, hiding the thing that's broken, you enhance it with gold. And to me, that's an interesting way of thinking about recompense and remembrance and repair. And so my thought was, I'd like to build a monument uh, that has something, that looks something like this. This is, sorry, this very rough draft sketch, but where, where, where uh, in height, it would mimic the heights of the ones in Rower and, and Manzanar, uh, f about 15 feet high. And, and, so, and with the lower uh, box cube-like structure being where we could, from inside the monument itself, using light projection technology, project the names so that it's almost like a one hour light show of names that start with the oldest person. There's a 90 some year old that went into camp all the way to the, the baby being born in Crystal City, Texas as the last baby born in camp and to, to rotate the names in a kind of respectful, reverential way. And that as families come to acknowledge and remember people like Taitetsuno and many others who 
uh, endured the forced relocation and incarceration. I wanted to have the, in this book of names a place where people could put in a gold line, draw in something that would uh, then appear on this physical monument as one more addition of gold. So that the, and we have part of the uh, monument be made of ceramic so that we could actually pre-break some lines and that those get filled in as the community interacts, heals, acknowledges, uh, and, and, and reckon with this history. And so uh, let me stop there uh, uh, with, with talking about uh, this project, but end with this idea that each name, like Titus Duno, matters. And that uh, this is a you know, history in which uh, you know, it goes all the way back to you know, Chinese exclusion to anti-alien land laws to like, it, it, Port Harbor and what happened with the Japanese is not the f first time or only, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's at the tail end of one thing and it's the front end of another thing that continues uh, all the way up to our kind of pandemic period, anti-Asian uh, 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 animus and, and so forth that, that uh, often erases names from American history often uh, categorizes people of Asian background as perpetually un-American, foreign, uh, even if you've been here five or six uh, generations. And so for me, this kind of, let's say Yamashita, let's say, you know, like, like, like uh, Uno, Taite, uh, like these names that uh, are part of American history as well. And so with that, let me uh, kind of in my formal remarks for this uh, lecture, and I'm very happy to take uh, any questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Williams. Um, un unfortunately, we're um, this is being live streamed okay. over YouTube, and I've been sort of not being bored or anything, but trying to figure out if there's a way to get YouTube questions, and I can't see any way to get any. In, uh, feedback or input from anybody who's been watching this on YouTube. So you're just stuck with us for questions, as far as I understand it. Okay. <laughs> we can do our job. All right, all right. So if, if there's anybody here who is you know, kind enough to come today in person who has a question, I'm happy to answer that. If not, I'm also happy to try to, if there are comments in the YouTube thing, maybe at a later date, try to answer the questions that way. Yes. Can you tell us more about, so the book will be displayed in terms of all the names at the base of the, but will the book then also be a printed book that would be, I mean, what, what is the material yes. that book look like? And Thank you very much for the question. So uh, the book itself is, is uh, going to be a very, it's like good, we actually use the Gutenberg Bible size as one kind of size uh, to get the idea of a sacred book, but we, we're, we're uh, printing them on a very particular kind of special paper. Uh, the font is being designed by uh, Burton Hasebe, who is a very important uh, uh, graphic designer. He's, I think, the only Asian American in top 100 graphic designers in America, but he's created a special font and a special glyph. You know, you need to, sep you don't want the names to run on to each other, so you need a glyph or some something in between, and it's these five lines that's kind of uh, uh, making them separate. And the book designers, uh, John Sueda and Chris Homoto, both professors at the California School of Design, they're, they're doing it in such a manner uh, and in the terms of the binding and so forth, where we're going to be putting it on display starting Obon. It's kind of like, again, August 15th, kind of commemorate this year's the 80th anniversary of the first Obon held in camp. And so we want to open this book up uh, through a procession from the Nishonganji Buddhist Temple as well as the Marino Church, two locations in Little Tokyo area of Los Angeles where people were taken to camp. Uh, and so uh, we're going to have an interfaith procession of priests to have three copies of this large book and bring it into the Japanese American National Museum, into the atrium, where we're going to have then a one-year campaign to have people come and put that gold line in to these books. Uh, to honor whoever they'd like to honor. And of course, we invite people who are not descendants. Uh, there's so many people, you know, who 
died in camp as bachelors or you know, the, the, you know, people who committed suicide in camp, like who need somebody to acknowledge that they don't have descendants to do that. So we were inviting everybody to come, but of course people who are descend, you know, camp survivors and descendants to put a gold line in, and that is gonna be reflected on the website and therefore later in that, in that large physical installation. That one is not gonna be built until January of 2025. Um, the idea of repair actually also has to do with the idea that once the community engages with the sacred book, they might find, I'm, I'm trying to do this so that it's 99 point, you know, five, five, you know, accurate, right? But we have to be humble that there might, I may, even despite all those rules and a team of 12 people working so hard of, over a couple of years to try to get this uh, uh, as accurate and comprehensive as possible, there may be somebody missing. So there's an opportunity to add people's names into the book, an opportunity to correct a misspelling, right? So that in the light show part of the physical monument and the website, one of the nice things with that kind of approach is that all those errors can be caught and you know we move towards not 100% but towards something that is as accurate as possible uh, that, that actually involves the community interacting with the monument. And so it's kind of like Mylin's idea, right? People make those rubbings and it's a, they look at the names beside it, yet you interact with the monument. That's what gives it meaning and that's what gives it repair or that power of healing as well. And so that's what I'm hoping the monument will be. Yeah, some interaction between that books, the website, and then this physical uh, uh, light, light installation show. Yes, please. So many of us have struggled at some level between being a scholar and an activist or mm. a scholar and artist. And I guess I'm curious, from all this work in engaging and thinking about you know, creating kind of a virtual object, a book, and thinking of, how do you think it's changed you as a scholar? You know, uh, quite possibly when American Sutra first came out, uh, in, in, it was the Day of Remembrance, February 19th, that's when Executive Order 9066 uh, was issued back in 1942. So we, we issued that then, and ever since then, I've been giving so many, you know, Japanese American community talks, book clubs at different uh, temples, or, you know, different community engagement. And one of the, one of the, uh, one of my you know, good friends from uh, uh, when I used to be at uh, UC Berkeley, the former president of the, of the Berkeley chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League, she uh, is one of the co-founders of a Japanese American racial justice group called Tsuru for Solidarity. And, and it's a group that many of them are camp survivors you know, whose fa fathers were taken away by the FBI and so forth experienced family separation and they were hearing the news about children being separated on the southern border and Nancy took one of the founders, took took color photocopies of the front of American Sutra and what they what they were doing was folding suru or you know Japanese word for cranes using like origami paper but she used the American Sutra book as kind of her paper and put them on places like Dilly, Texas. The first protest was there uh, in, in, in that year, 2019. And soon I began, because of that, I had to also, you know, I, get, I became involved with, with that group and uh, other kinds of uh, 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 groups concerned about racial justice after George Floyd, about, about uh, the, the rise of anti-Asian violence, including in my neighborhood, uh, you know, it wasn't my temple, uh, but the two temples down, uh, Higash Honganji was vandalized, uh, arson, you know, somebody started to set it on fire, uh, uh, you know, destroyed the lantern in front of it. And this came on the heels of six uh, Buddhist temples in Orange County, six Vietnamese American temples uh, being vandalized, uh, people spray painting G the word Jesus on the back of statues and that kind of thing. And so we came to realize that, you know, Buddhist, Buddhist temples sometimes serve as, just like maybe for Muslims, the mosques, or for Jews, the synagogue sometimes comes under attack as a kind of like cultural symbol of a, of a community. And so this is not, you know, kind of like separate. It's it kind of my community and my temple uh, uh, membership was feeling 
these things and 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 so and 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 going to the border and doing different things to kind of see the interlinks between what happened back then in World War II and what's happening in uh, different ways with this kind of enduring American question of like you know how do you belong so I think for me personally I became a US citizen after 33 years in this country just before the 2020 election I, I finally became a US citizen and uh, it was on Juneteenth uh, in the middle of a pandemic the, uh, in LA City Hall with all the protests going on and and so I, I was really feeling those words of Reverend uh, Tokunaga about inheriting you know the karma of a nation what it means to become a new citizen and what do you take on and so I think that particular happenstance uh, uh, combined with all these other things uh, made it feel very important to, to see how one's scholarship and research can have some kind of impact, uh, trans transformational impact in the world uh, where hopefully something that you're uncovering and recovering is, 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 is uh, helpful to some people uh, and, 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 and gives people new frameworks of thinking about things, uh, new ways to feel connected uh, to different uh, topics. And so, uh, yeah, I've always been, you know, for, I've, I've been a priest since I was 21 years old, but I've also been a you know, scholar as well. And I've always tried to find a nice balance you know, between that. And sometimes I try to keep them separate. Sometimes I find a way to kind of merge it. Sometimes you know, you do the right appropriate thing in the right moment. But um, uh, in these times, it, it's, I, I, I'll put on my robes as much as I put on just regular, you know, my, uh, my professor hat, as, as it were. Uh, and, it, and it seems this is one of the freedoms Buddhism gets, you know, jijus on my, like your, you can, your mind can move freely everywhere. Uh, that's one of, the, one of the freedoms I feel like we're, we're suggested by the tradition that these boundaries are kind of artificial, and we have our imagination to allow us to, 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 to you know, do some, do some things that maybe sometimes can cross boundaries as well. Oh, sure, yeah. Thank you so much. It's so valuable having you here tonight. My one question is, do you have any questions for the speaker this I'm sorry, I couldn't hear your last part. Do you have any questions for this project? Anything that you're trying to figure out that you're excited to learn? So the question was, uh, do I have any uh, uh, questions or can, things that I'm thinking about around this uh, uh, monument? And, and I think, you know, it, it, it's something where I'm, I'm uh, kind of going off the last question too. Sometimes you enter territory that you're not, it's not your comfort zone, you know what I mean? Uh, I was trained as Japan studies scholar and, you know, Buddhist studies, and I feel more or less comfortable in those zones, but uh, doing some things related to racial justice or thinking about monuments broadly or uh, having to consider, well, how does this relate to something like the lynching memorial in Alabama or say their name, you know, uh, 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 kind of po police uh, 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 reform and so forth. These are things that I'm not, this is not my training, you know, but, but uh, it's something that uh, uh, I feel like in America today, there is a larger conversation about monuments. Uh, and I know a lot of, you know, focus goes on like Confederate statues in the American South, but uh, Asian Americans also, uh, you know, it, there's, a, there's a place for Asian American discourse in uh, the topic of America's monuments. There's a place for thinking about even like a Buddhist way to think about what is a monument? How do we remember? How do we remember and repair? Uh, what is the purpose of monument? What's a monument? difference between a memorial and a monument, you know, there's all these questions that I don't have the full answers for, but uh, uh, those are the type of things I try to, uh, yeah, I'm trying to grapple with these days. Yes? Do you have any comments on the, the monument or memorial that's in D.C. with the cranes that are, um, you know, uh, encircled by barbed wire? Barbed wire, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, and so there, there's a, uh, 
uh, in, Wa in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, a kind of gen general uh, kind of uh, monument uh, uh, that's uh, about the incarceration, but also about uh, uh, kind of Japanese-American patriotism in relationship to uh, military service. And, and, and so, you know, there, I think that there, there is these, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's very touchy sometimes, right, how we do the symbolism. Uh, uh, cranes or birds, you know, caught in barbed wire, is that the right imagery? Uh, what, what is it that, uh, uh, is, the, is, is, is it about recalling the hardship or is it recalling uh, the overcoming uh, a persistence, uh, et cetera? What is, the, what is the right tone and right, right uh, thing to kind of put together? And so, uh, so is your question about like, you know, the birds getting ensnared in the barbed wire? I'm just wondering what you think of that monument because I know it's controversial. Yeah, yeah. You know, so for me, like, for example, the, the cranes that we've been putting on the fence lines of uh, Border Patrol and ICE detention centers uh, as a way to show people back in World War II, so few people, you know, raised a voice when their neighbors were being taken away. Like, this is a time, actually, it's healing for the community to do that kind of outreach. And so the crane, to me, and the bird, you know, from a Buddhist standpoint, I, I always like to use that, you know, there's that classical metaphor of like, you know, uh, one, one wing is wisdom, one wing is compassion, and then, you know, that's how the bird flies. So I always saw those cranes as symbolizing kind of like that possibility of going to freedom and, 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 and then that, that getting entrapped in the, in, in the barbed wire is, of course, a powerful uh, thing of like how that freedom gets, gets uh, gets uh, uh, stopped or contracted. And so, uh, but I'm also kind of a big fan of, of, of being able to see the bird fly too, you know, uh, and, 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 and the power of the community to uh, not, comp not always, because to me like the most powerful things are people like Taitetsuno and others who survived the camps, who raised the next generation, who uh, did something uh, to, to not just persevere and survive, but to, to, to contribute something. Contribute, despite all that, something in a place like Smith College about Buddhism, you know? That's powerful uh, of, 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 of what not just survives and persists, but, but, but is, 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 is uh, is, is creatively doing something to contribute to the American religious landscape, academic land, all these other things, and, 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 and the politics of, of, of our time. And so um, I'm hoping the type of imagery that I would like to use will f feature less barbed wire. Like, it w I, I hope it's more kind of on the, on the side of like, uh, uh, what can, what can, what can, what can we draw from this history that's interlinked to different kinds of, uh, of difficulties that uh, different communities, past and present, continue to face? But what's the where's the power going to come from to, 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 to tackle that? So that's kind of where I think the power of reimagining monuments could be. Uh, I think that monument was built in a certain time, and you know, it is it's, it's a, a very powerful monument for that uh, moment. And, and, but I feel like in today's time, we need a different kind of concept of what, 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 what's, what are monuments for and what's, what, who, who are they for and, and what are we trying to do with them? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I have two questions. One is um, uh, Kintsugi. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm familiar with that, of course. Uh, this is the, using the gold to fill in, and it's usually when some famous potter, or I own yeah. some Shoji Hamada plate, and I break it. And so I get some really famous guy to fill it with gold, and it becomes right. kind of even more unique in that way. Right. But I've never heard of, until now, purposely breaking something for the purpose yeah. of doing kintsugi. So yeah. I'm a little bit curious about that. Yeah. So that's a little bit of a debate in our, in our construction circle. 
<laughs> about, about pre-breaking or ha having the concept of a crack that, that uh, uh, gets filled in with, you know, gold beads or like there's lots of discussion about what's the actual appropriate way to frame it and 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 uh, uh, the pre-breaking thing it, it, there's a artist in, in LA Victor Solomon who's been doing a lot of uh, work on racial justice and working with the MBA and different uh, African-American uh, communities in Los Angeles um, He's, I think, you know, he's of, of, of Mexican American and Cambodian American heritage himself. But he's been working a lot on uh, taking, you know, during the pandemic, especially a lot of the basketball courts in South Central parts of LA and elsewhere, they've been kind of disused, and all these cracks are appearing in the asphalt and whatever. And so he's been working on kind of like doing kintsugi on the basketball courts. And anyway, I, I just find it very, very. Um, creative for people like that to take, you know, yes, it is true, it's a, you know, it's a certain, you know, you, you, if you go to art dealers, they will, they will show you the provenance and, the, and the, the where, when it's broken, except in, in, you know, like uh, 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 certain kinds of pottery in Japan, uh, when, you're, when, when you're trying to uh, 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 look, look at the kind of important uh, 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 ceramic pieces. But I, I, I found it very, very, Powerful to take a, to do something like, like uh, repair basketball courts, or to to, to to think about it in terms of uh, of racial justice that this one particular artist is doing, and I was I've been kind of inspired by him to kind of like try to ex expand it a little bit with this idea of you know it's already broken, right? So we're all already in you know. Nothing is going, however value, you know, it's already broken. And so the pre-break thing is, is kind of coming from that of like, we're already broken, you know? We're already finite. We can't stay the same form forever. And that, and that break line is something that, to me, like there's actually a lot of creativity in the break line. And, 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 and that's, where, that's where actual work can happen. And so I'm trying to explore that, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. The other follow-up was going to be just, you know, as I understand it, and I'm not so entirely up to date on things, but some of the same camps that were used as internment camps back in the day are now being used as, I don't know what they're called, um, uh, places for settling refugees right. from south of the border, and that that has caused a whole lot of other faith communities to come together. Have you been experiences in your project? Sure. So Sudhu for Solidarity, that group I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, initially went down to Dilly, Texas, which was at that, that time, there was only three. There was Burks in uh, Pennsylvania, and then Dilly, and then uh, Carnes, an another one in, in Texas. But they're called family residential centers. Uh, but basically, they're the, where the children who are separated from families end up, and sometimes women are in these facilities as well. And under the Biden administration, they have been folded back. But during the time of 2019, that's where it was. And right next to Dilly is Crystal City, Texas, one of the large Department of Justice camps that held so many Japanese Americans, but also some Japanese Peruvians who were forcibly kidnapped, basically, in Peru, brought to the United States. They landed in places like Louisiana. And then as soon as they stepped on American soil, they were like, you're here illegally, and then taken in by the Department of Justice and then put in these camps. They were meant as hostage, you know, like prisoner exchange things with the Japanese for the POWs that the Japanese Imperial Army had, had, had captured. But for that reason, that particular camp had these Latin American Japanese people and they were using, you know, this other facility right nearby. And so that's how they made that connection of like, we need to do something. And when it was announced that there's too, too many kids in the Delhi facility and that they would need to make a new one uh, in, in Oklahoma called Fort Sill, and the governor there agreed to it and so forth, 
uh, and they were going to take out 1,300 children and put them in there. That camp was back in World War II, you know, the Fort Sill internment camp. It was used a portion. Of, it's, it's, it's always been a joint U.S. Army and Marine Corps uh, artillery training facility, field artillery training. But they had a section of the camp where, you know, about 900 or so uh, uh, Japanese uh, nationals, 90 of whom were Buddhist priests. 90 Buddhist priests were in this one camp. And they were only there for a short period of time, which is why it's not that well known a camp. But it's well known because two peop there were four people that died in that short period of time, two of them shot by guards, all right, both at the fence line. And they had 90 Buddhist priests, so at least they could do a funeral, you know what I mean? And, and as far as I know, up until that point in American Buddhist history, that's the largest Buddhist ceremony that ever took place with 90 Buddhist priests. It was a place in Oklahoma when they were doing the funerals for these people. And you know, even today, Jiko Nakade at uh, Kono Daifukuji Temple, it's her grandfather that was killed. Right? And, and, and so we went as Buddhist priests, like I, I, I just organized Buddhist priests, and we about 25 of us went, and we performed ceremony. We worked with, uh, it's called United We Dream, it's a Latinx dreamer organization, and we kind of, it's this kind of young people, and then these Buddhist priests, we kind of marched together, chanted together, did ceremony together, remembered people who died in ICE and Border Patrol facilities, children who died, you know, in just the last few years but also remembering what happened in World War II because they're using the same place. It's the same place where Geronimo died. It's the same place where Native Americans were, you know. So there's this long history in which Japanese America and the World War II experience is just one part of a longer strand of history. And, uh, but this is how we're connected. And so that, that, that's, that's how we're trying to do it. Is that okay? Okay. I guess we're done. Please. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. For you new super influencers out there, he did make the offer. You can write to him and talk to him personally. Thank you.